Ooh, Grandma got it going on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us for Conversations with Women on the Move. We are so happy and excited to be able to bring some of the women from our national television show to Life Online. And to kick this all off, we have Miss Margaret Avery, thank you so much for joining us live. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This is new for me. I've never done this before. This, Facebook on live, yeah. This is your very first time? I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, oh, if, if I've done it before, I didn't know it. And I, I mean, like I said before, you know, how do, how do you do this? You send a link just like, I guess, Zoom, huh? Yeah. But I'm glad. I'm glad. It's, you, you, you learn something every day. Absolutely. You're being stretched. We're stretching you a little bit. You sure are. <laughs> so happy to have you here. And let me just, let me say, I know that some of the viewers have not seen your uh, episode on the, your, your segment on the show that just aired, but it is just wonderful. Learning about your story and getting the opportunity to interview you was really just magical. I just want to share that with you. It, it's so inspiring. Aww. And so many people have been moved and touched by your story. So happy to be able to share some here. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share. You know, the thing about sharing, first of all, you don't really realize, well, myself, I really don't. Um, what I'm trying to say is you don't realize how much you have to give to people until you start talking about it and uh, it's almost like a cathartic thing that happens you know um, you feel good when you know that people appreciate your experience and that they are actually learning and identifying with your experience and that's why this streaming and the other medias are so important that we can stay in communication with one another and we all know and discover that we're not that much different. Absolutely, yeah. There's so much more that we have in common than than we than not. And I think that it is always important, but it is especially important during this time as we have been estranged from each other. And so, being able to connect with people and hear people's story to know that you know you are not the only one, I think, is so vital particularly in this moment in time. And you have so many stories that you shared of inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanna share a few of those here as well so that we can inspire someone who may not be feeling as if they're in the best place right now. Okay. Yeah, you know, I believe that life is lived in seasons. And some of those seasons are great high seasons and some of them are not so great, but we have to be able to hold on during the ones that aren't so great until we get into one that is great again. Amen. Absolutely. So one of the stories that you shared that I thought was just so wonderful was around your time after the color purple. So as mm -hmm. many of the viewers already, you know, they recognize you from the uh, probably I'm sure the best known role uh, that you have had in your acting career. And that is Shug, Miss Shug Avery from The Color yeah. Purple. And as, go ahead. Why don't you? I, show as a matter of fact, people don't know my first name. They just call me Shug. Yes. Um, my last name and the character name are the same, Avery. So, uh, yes. A lot of times people will say, well, gee. Wasn't that something that Alice Walker named her character after you? And I said, no, dear. It just happened that my name was Margaret Avery and the character is Suge Avery. Yeah. Divine ordering. Divine right. ordering. Yeah. Share a little bit about how that role became yours. How it became mine? Yes. How you became the um, character to play it. Well, it was a pretty lengthy interview process. Uh, I think you got that in the other interview, how uh, I had to fight to be seen. Yeah. And please uh, share it here, Margaret, because many people that see this would not have seen your other I interview. understand. Yeah. Well, when I came back from Jakarta, I had been singing there and uh, my answering service, we, they were big at that time. You're talking about what? 
almost 40 years ago, Lord. And I had all these messages on there. Margaret, Margaret, have you, do you know anything about the color purple? You should get your agent on it. And I had about, gee, it must have been a dozen calls. And as I have said before, it's not, it's not common for your competitors to call you and tell, tell you about an interview. So, um, I approached my agent about it, and they said, you know, they won't see you. And at that time, it was uh, it was Ruben Cannon casting, and, and they he said, no, you're not right for the part. So I read the the book and really gravitated towards Suge Avery. Uh, I I wanted it, and I just Ruben Cannon had inv had cast me in many other television shows of uh, the episode episodic TV shows that young people don't even remember anymore. But I told him, I said, I wrote this little note and said, Ruben, if you don't see me, I'm going to sit on your doorstep. I know where you live and I'm not going to leave until you allow me to interview for that. And so he's, he responded right away and he helped me. He said, um, when I read, he said, you know, I know you're not right for the part, but, and he said that because uh, Quincy Jones being the producer wanted a singer actor. And so he says, but I believe that your work is, is really worthy of seeing. And I must have interviewed, oh, I, probably several times, but this is the important thing I want people to know. Once I got cast, now I had the role. We hadn't started shooting. I'm now preparing. But once I found out who all had competed for, big names, I started just thinking, oh, my God, you mean this person interviewed and this, they didn't want that person. How, how could it be me? I started talking myself out of the role. Yeah. And I had to get on my knees and just pray, dear God, please give me the courage and to believe in myself. They chose me. Alice Walker wanted me. Don't let me screw this up. And I want people to understand that sometimes we get in our own way. And we, if you have to go and pray or whatever it is, you got to get your inner strength together. Can you imagine if I had backed out of that? I mean, I wouldn't even have a career today. That one movie, even though I had been working for 20 years, nobody knew who I was. But after that one movie, at least people knew who I was. Yeah. So ladies, trust yourself. Go for it. When you get that opportunity, we used to say, girl, pee. <laughs> That's an old expression. Only we vets would know. A compliment was you see somebody on the stage and you go backstage and say, girl, you pee. Oh, my goodness. I'm I don't know what the expression is today for the young yeah. people. Well, I think what's so wonderful about that is, you know, we all, whether you're in Hollywood or, you know, in the middle of Chicago living your life, we all know what it is to start to have the self-doubts. In yoga, I'm a yogi, uh, we call it the chattering monkeys that sit on your shoulder, you know, negative talk in your ear. Mm. And so it's important that wherever it shows up in our lives, we take control back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through our own mindfulness and whether we need to start speaking things or start listening to things or start praying or meditating, we have to do whatever is necessary to keep ourselves on our divine path. And I thank you for sharing that because it happens to everyone. And you know what? You said something. We Even if we read, if you can read the daily word each day, because our environment can become so negative and we don't realize how much of that we're taking in. Um, and to be rejuvenated each day is so important because we've got our bodies. It's the physical part, but it's also the spiritual and the mental part. 
and that will control the mental and the spiritual is going to control so much of how we think. And uh, I know that when, when I'm meditating on a daily basis, uh, and I'm into transcendental meditation, they taught us back in the 70s, it was a big fad at that time. But I noticed that I'm calmer and I'm not as reactive. People, uh, the the road rage, you know, I don't have to get involved with that. I, I'm not reacting to somebody's being negative and then I got to top that. And, you know, that's not godly. And when your spirit is in a good place, your inner strength is there and you you make better decisions. You're more positive. Am I making sense? Absolutely. And you change the energy. And Absolutely. so you attract more positivity to you mm -hmm. as opposed to the negative. And in many ways, you can help to release someone else's negativity just through your mm -hmm. you being positive in so many ways. Now I have let me this makes me think of something else. And you women out there, I want you to know that I grew up in an alcoholic home. I'm getting a little off base here, but I'll bring it back in. And I learned and and it was a single parent that my, I grew up with, alcoholic very poor and we never had anything i was like at 13 years old mowing heavy lawnmowers to help pay the rent uh, and it was 50 cents a lawn and i was i was doing like 30 lawns a, a month i still have the corns on my hands mm. but my point is we were so poor, I never I never asked for anything because I knew that it would just be pressure on my mom and we didn't have the money. Well, what that did, what I learned in counseling, and that's why I'm saying the benefit of counseling, is that those, those things that we do as a child to protect ourselves, if we continue doing that into our adult life, it doesn't always, it's not always healthy. And I, I, I learned not to ask for anything. Mm. So in a relationship, I never even, it was always, did I please the other person? Or, or I'll, I'll go without this. That's okay. And that's not right. Or what I learned also was that, um, I was attracted to a certain type of guy. And my baby's father, we divorced. And then 15 years later, I met someone else. He was exactly the same guy, only a different ethnicity. So it was only until after I decided to get my master's in, I thought it was going to be education, but this was during the time that I couldn't buy a job, y'all. Yeah, so and, and we're gonna to, we're gonna come we're gonna wrap back around to that. But okay. I want you to finish this point. Okay, so when I decided to to get my master's in psychology, oh, it was so therapeutic. I learned all about this stuff with behavior and 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 how I kind of had a shit magnet right here in my at my forehead. I attracted men that were not healthy for me. Yeah. Um. Uh, and so only through counseling, and we were talking about meditation helping you, counseling can help you too, ladies, because you find out about yourself. And the guy that I'm with now, we've been together 24 years. Honey, I without the counseling, I never would have noticed him. I never would have, but, but only because I changed and became healthy, I was able to make healthy choices. And so how that all comes together is that, we need to be healthy in whatever we're doing. Okay. Well, let me ask okay. you. Okay. Is that all making you. sense? Yes. It's all making sense. And I'm going to extract a few things and we're going to go, we're going to get into a few things, but I want to ask you this because I know a lot of women are thinking about this. And as you well know, a lot of women 
have challenges around their intimate relationship and mm -hmm. choosing the not so right person for them in the moment and choosing the same person over and over again with absolutely friends. absolutely yes. and then, so with men too they'll do that choose the absolutely. same woman over absolutely. and over again and wonder why why do they do me that way <laughs> yes yes but this is what i want to know because you said you never would have noticed him so what did you change if you could share that with us to allow you to notice someone that before you would have never paid attention to other than a therapy something specific what did, what did you what did you shift i think i was always attracted to the guy with the humor and we want someone to have humor and even my art he has humor but um somebody that walked in the room and you noticed him yeah you know um i never looked for the depth of the person it was always how they made me feel you know in the beginning they always make you feel good <laughs> <laughs> but when i grew up as a woman i was able to see the the maturity in a man and um it's just changed my life so things because, so, because a lot of times you want to in a situation you want to blame that person well he didn't do this or she didn't do that or whatever but we what we always in any situation you have to look at yourself as to what part you may have played yes. in the getting coming to that result and as you change or myself as i worked on changing myself and this is this is this is the interesting part you change how someone reacts to you. You don't have you don't you don't try to change them. The change comes from them reacting differently to you because you are acting differently. Yeah, yeah. Get that? Yes, that is so powerful. Because we always want to look, well, he didn't do this, and she and, and it's in any situation. We always want to look at the other person, but you gotta remember there was something something that we may have done or you may have done myself i have to like was it my tone was it this was it that or maybe i could have said it like this yes there's something and if somebody is abusing you you're getting something out of that you're letting them abuse you what what part are you playing in that dance yeah. Because it's not going to change until you change the step. Well, look, we can we can bring you back here for relationship talk with Margaret. OK, oh, I learned yeah. a lot. I learned a lot and I'm still learning a lot because yes. age changes the relationship, too. Of course, of course. And so, so I can talk a long time about that. I know. I know. We're going to bring you back just to do just that, because I know a lot of these a lot of the young women would love to get uh some tips and advice and wisdom. well I'll, I'll say this one thing the the last relationship that i was in i was so anxious and so i was so happy to be in love yes being in being in love with being in love you know because years had gone back gone by uh since my baby's the daddy and i split up and so all those years, it was like working on my career and in single parenting. And, you know, because when you're raising a child, you tell them you got to be home by 10 o'clock. Well, then I had to be home by 10 o'clock to make sure. So I gave up a lot, I felt, of my life trying to raise and raise a child and work. So when Mr. Wonderful came by, oh, my God. And there were signs. Now, my, didn't I say that my mother was an alcoholic? And, yes, who, what, yes. and what was he? An alcoholic. Alcoholic, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And there were signs that, they because somebody said years ago, you can tell, if you meet a guy, you can tell in 10 minutes exactly where he's coming from if you listen. Sure. But, but ladies, so many times we're so into 
having a guy in our lives or being in love with being in love like I was, you don't see the signs because you don't want to see them. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right. And when you start to listen and pay attention, not to what you want to hear. Absolutely. Uh, to, yeah. What? There you got it. Now you yes. got it. Not yes. what you want to hear. Yes. But what they are saying and telling you, because people will show you exactly who they are. Believe mm -hmm. them. You know, and look at their friends who yeah. they hang out with. And please meet their parents. <laughs> please, Lord have mercy. Well, that's if they if they allow you to, because you know, Mark, a lot of people don't want you to meet their parents. Okay? Well, you, uh, that's a luxury. That's a luxury for some people. Well, you might that might be, but you, you definitely you can see their friends. Yeah, for sure. You could definitely see your, see their friends. So we are, we're going to bring you back to do some <laughs> Q&A. &A I probably, probably said it all now. Yeah. But I want to go back to the color purple. Okay. And I want to go back to Miss Suge specifically. Now, in the movie, were you singing? No, that was the lovely oh, five foot. Puerto Rican bombshell named Tata Vega. And I think she had been singing with the Andre Crotch uh, Choir. But, you know, we don't look at credits. People today still think that I, I sang. Now, I, I may have been able to sing the other song, Sister, Sister, you've been on my mind. The, I'm, when I was singing, I sang pop and I like jazz, but I never sang gospel. And Tata, she tore the roof down the one in that God's trying to tell you something. And Absolutely. that's what we've been talking about. God will try to tell you something if you listen. Yes. <laughs> listen. Yes. But yes. she made that scene without without Tata Vega's voice. You never would have uh been drawn to that church scene. Let me ask you you a question about what you just stated that God God is trying to tell you something. Um what do you think speak to to that and God communicating with us? Because I hear so many women talk about that and talk about um them not knowing when God is trying to give them a sign or show them a way to go, they don't necessarily feel connected to the intuition. Mm -hmm. How would well, you I think in order to be connected, first of all, you got to be healthy. Okay, we talked. We talked about that. Let's get yourself healthy, a healthy mind, and and believe in yourself. Not looking for somebody else to be your savior. Um, I lost my thought there. Um, God gave animals instincts or I, I, they gave us a brain, but animals, if you watch the animals shows and, and they're the deer or whoever, I, whatever is drinking water, they got their, they're listening. I mean, they, and they, they're, they're hearing these these things are the ones that keep them alive. Okay. Now they're not like just they're drinking water and, and lollygagging or anything. They are always in tune. So he gave us a brain and we have to function knowing that there is, there is danger out there. Now, if you're going to like go into a club and you're drinking, 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 is your brain, that's my phone. Like, I'm sorry. That's okay. I got, to get, uh, got them hung up. Somebody who hasn't called me in five years, wouldn't they call me now? I'm a, they must be hearing this message. <laughs> <laughs> but my thought is use your brain. Now, and I told my daughter on her honeymoon, they decided to go to St. Lucia and it's really a beautiful place. I said, now listen, 
use your brain. You can't be out there on the beach all lovey-dovey and you're, you're in another country. So this person is persistent. <laughs> hey, babe, we can't talk to you. Call, I'll call you back. Now, why is she going to call me? She's from New York. Haven't heard from her in, what, a decade? And now she's persistent. Is, is, is this running? Maybe she's, she's seeing this right now. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, we're what was I saying? You use our brains, lady. Yes. That's what it is. Um you don't go into a club and get drunk, right? Um you don't you don't just hang out with a stranger. Am I on the right track here? Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I get it. And, and find out find out about a person before yes. you, you invite them into your home. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and watch for the signs, right? Watch for the signs. You know, I always believe that God sends us signs and they start off, you know, little whispers, a little pebble, a little pebble, right? Mm -hmm. And then you don't listen. And then the pebble becomes a rock. And then a stone and then a boulder drops on your head mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, because you didn't pay attention. So, no, absolutely. God is always trying to tell you something. And you know what? It's so hard to walk away from a situation when you really want somebody in your life. It's yeah. it's hard. It is hard. Um, but we have to have faith that the right person will be there for us. Absolutely. And what do you feel about and what how do ladies think about dating outside of your race i think it's fabulous i mean because to me if somebody makes me feel good and i'm i'm their queen and they're not my same color i'm okay with it i don't know how everybody else feels yeah absolutely but, but when you can't find someone it doesn't happen um to me i mean of, of your own ethnicity is it isn't it okay I mean, yeah. God made us all here to love Absolutely. one another. Yeah, that could be. That's that's the subject we could get on. Absolutely, yeah. We'll we'll definitely bring you back to talk about all of these things. So let's share the story of what happened after the color purple with you in Hollywood, because as an outsider, you know. Americans who saw the film and who knew how wonderful the film was and all the accolades that you received for it. Many people would never know that after that, you had a very difficult time being hired in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Now you got to go back. What was Color Purple was like, it was released in 86 or 87. So how many years ago was that? A lot. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, I mean, you didn't have blacks that many on television and you didn't have black films other than, you know, prior to that time, it was the uh, black exploitation films. Remember, uh, we were we were doing commercials well at that time, but there wasn't a, the opportunity that there is today right. for women of color. There was more opportunity for the men of color than than women because we'll look at Danny Glover his his uh his career um he he was what Bruce Willis's sidekick in Lethal yeah. Weapon and you know he wasn't the men of color were not limited to having connection with the black family they didn't have to have a wife or whereas the woman of color, the actor, I always would have to be married to someone as even now being an older actor, I've got to be somebody's mother or grandmother. Uh, it's never really starring. Uh, you understand? I do. So after the color purple, oh, I was all excited. It was so wonderful being in a a quality film because I've only been doing television and uh, prior to that, the black exploitation film. So to do color purple and they fed you well, Oh, that's how you know you're on a good budget film when they feed you right, honey. Okay. So, um, 
And I used to tell Whoopi, here we were way out in the country of North Carolina, not that far from Charlotte, but on the outskirts. And she would send her assistant out way back into town to get some greasy hamburger. I said, girl, are you going to blow up if you keep eating like that? Whoopi, I told you. That- <laughs> but anyway, we were fed so well. And I think it was July 4th. We, I mean, they, they gave us quality food. So, so I'm talking and getting off the point here. What what was I going to say? So, so um, you were sharing how your your inability to get work after. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I went to managers, and I don't know of any black managers. I go to white managers, and they said, "Well, what am I going to do with you?" Okay, I'm. So I said, "Uh, get me work." <laughs> no. And I would see these ads for actors. Uh, we want a we want a Margaret Avery type. And I said, "Well, wait a minute. Why don't they cast me?" You know. Yes. <laughs> and I remember uh, trying to do television after two years. I well, well, I'm I'm going ahead of myself. When there was no work, what pulled me through was, <clears throat> excuse me, the college lecture circuit. And so I was a I. Lord, I made more money on that than I did Color Purple. And then I eventually had to just do television. Excuse me. Sure. And I remember a casting person saying, you mean Margaret Avery will do television? Well, see, that's the thing. See, most of the time when you do a film, the quality of Color Purple, you don't do television anymore. But there was nothing more for me to do. Yes. Yes. You see? So, (coughs) excuse me. And there's that thing that only with the system, and I've heard Denzel say this too, they only let one in. Mm. And the one that got in was Whoopi. Yes. And that's because she had a three-picture deal, so she could go from Color Purple to the other two that she did. And the other two was not, that wasn't a sister act. I don't believe okay. it was. It was lightning, grease lightning and something else. Okay. And Oprah, she had her show in Chicago and it went syndic- it became syndicated when um, co- after Color Purple was released. And so everyone thought, oh, Color Purple gave her that opportunity. No, she had been a hit show in Chicago. And so that's, that's how she re- was able to become the big name that she is. So after Color Purple, I would look, I, I think, uh, oh, let me just say this too. The other problem was that we got a lot of stack, a lot of bad press on Color Purple from the black community because Color Purple now was the first film, black film out since Sounder. Now, you remember the lovely, wonderful Sounder with Paul Winfield and our lovely late Cicely Tyson? I mean, to this day, it's a classic and it leaves you uplifted the color purple was from a fictional book that could be real well when you when you haven't seen black people like in europe or even in this country if you haven't been around black people socializing with us you can have film is so so strong i mean and influential, you can think that that's the way black people are. And so our men felt very offended by that that film. Now, if we had had all the films going on now that we have, they wouldn't have felt that way. Sure. But I, I, could, under, like- I could understand the flack that we got. Even the NAACP gave us flack. Yeah. And then they turned around and wanted to honor us. So it, it was a very confusing time. <laughs> you want to say, well, uh, duh. <laughs> but 
but they picketed the film and then they gave us awards. Uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't a film that we that was to represent our people. It was it was a story. It started out being Alice Walker's Pulitzer Prize winning book. Yes, that that's that was the origins of it. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that after Color Purple, there were no black films for me to 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 bounce into. Um, Whoopi was able to do her thing, and even Denzel will tell you they just let one in, one at a time. And uh, I believe. Uh, oh, oh, and the other actor. Samuel Jackson. See yeah. how his career just exploded after Pulp Fiction? I don't think there was a black woman in the film. He didn't have to link himself with that. And after yeah. after Pulp Fiction, he's he does I mean he does black films, but he's not limited. Well, yeah. you know, speaking of Samuel Jackson and and other uh, wonderful actors that you've mentioned, you've been linked to some extraordinary leading men. Yes. Who was yes. your favorite? Who was your favorite? Oh, just a sweetheart, Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor. And that's when I learned how a, a person can be on stage one way but when off stage, be a totally different person. He was so shy and such a sweet man. Um, I have a story where uh, we were, I was the country wife in Which Way Is Up? And Vanetta, Lonette McKee was the city wife. And uh, Richard and I, our scene, we had a we had a bed scene where we both were in bed, but you know, in those days, you didn't show anything like today. Lord, have mercy! But uh, we both just before shooting, we were both looking for a place to kind of like you know, if you got to get in bed with somebody, you're going to be checking out your arms and whatever. <laughs> I mean, now it's oh, it's a little personal, and I was trying to go to a room and. Richard was putting deodorant on and 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 I was like putting makeup on my corns. <laughs> <laughs> and we were both laughing at each other. He was he was just such a human guy and just just a wonderful guy to work with. Except that he was spontaneous and I was right off the television and um that's you, you have your lines all pre-memorized and sure. you know what you're going to say. You know when you're going to breathe and, and television directors just say, OK, uh, on this line, you go over there and I'll buy that by the second line. I want you to be here. That that's the extent of your direction. So with Richard and I think I shared this before, he's so comics are so uh, spontaneous. We were about to shoot the first scene. And he says, well, well, wait, Michael Schultz was the director. He says, oh, wait, 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 Michael, I I, I know. Uh, and he goes over to Michael and he starts whispering, I, I'm going to do this and and then I'm going to do such and such. And Michael is just chuckling, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, Richard passes me and I said, but Richard, and then what do I do? He looked at me and he said, I don't know. <laughs> 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 oh, I thought I would die. And so um, once again, I go to the trailer and I pray, oh, dear God, please, please let me remember my training. It's, a, it's called improv, y'all. Yes, yes. Improvisation. You don't know what the person is going to say, but yeah. you respond honestly as your character. And here I am again on my knees. Please, dear God, don't let me blow this. Let me... Give me confidence. Let me believe in myself. Don't let me think Margaret Avery. Let me think the character, be the character. And, and, and I'm, sure you hit, I'm sure you hit it. I'm sure you hit I it. I did. I had so yeah. much fun. Yeah. I had so much fun working with him. But well, you, you know, but once again, the, the I think the lesson is rid yourself of your fears because they will hold you back. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Now, what is the number one way to do that? Because so many people have them, but have no idea how to get rid of them. Well, I think it's it's healthy to have a little bit. I mean, it's like every time I go on stage to perform, or maybe it's just before the the uh, director says action, I feel this kind of a nervousness. But once I speak, it's gone because I'm believing in me. And I think as an actor, the way you have confidence is to be prepared. You you can't expect to do a great job or believe in yourself if you've had no training, you've had no adequate training. Sure. And your experience is what's going to help build you, build your confidence. Um, whenever I hear a lecture, and, and you know, I used to be teaching and and, and going to seminars also as a psychologist, I could tell the people who were the speakers and were speaking from experience, not just from a textbook. Yes. And they keep you engaged because you, what they're saying is from their experience and you can relate to it. Do, you understand? I mean, there's a connection there that they have with reality. Um. I remember having this one class that I needed when I am in the master's program to work in the school system. And this one class was taught by someone who at the university had written a book. They even used his book. It was all about how to manage children in the classroom. He had never been in a classroom. And those of us who had been teaching, we thought, oh, this is a bunch of crap. This is not going to work. But in order to pass the class, we had to, like, regurgitate what he was saying. But we all knew it was a lie. Uh, and that's just politics. He was able to get that job. But you have to know, you can't just jump into something and expect to have confidence learn if you want to learn you want you want your own hair salon then work in the hair salon first and and learn products and and learn how to deal with people i mean there's a lot in any business that you do it's so competitive and there's so many things that you need to learn about it you can't expect to just take money fix up a, whatever it is that you're doing and then know how to run the business yeah Absolutely. You have to do the preparation. You have to do you have to do the work. Do the work and then when the opportunity comes, soar. Yeah. Because you're prepared. Absolutely. And if you don't know how to do something, reach out. That's why they're gonna get mad at me. But there are so many black organizations that give these affairs and they're starting late or there's problems at the door. And I mean, it's, you always think, well, oh, here's some more mess because, and they've done it year after year after year. Well, when you're in charge of it, ask somebody who did it the year before and say, Hey, what, what should I look out for? What should we do? What were some of the problems? reach out and ask when people when you see a new business come up in your neighborhood or in your community they've done research they know how many people are passing that area every day if it's a good location they've already done who who what's the income of that neighborhood most of those people will what kind of products will they buy what's the price range they've done all this stuff so we can't expect to be prosperous if if we don't know a damn thing. Yeah. And the and and the most important thing is just use common sense. Okay, I'm, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. We get it. We get it. And I think you know to sum up what you're saying, you cannot fake experience. And you Absolutely. cannot fake doing the work. 
Mm. And when you do that, when opportunity shows up, you will have the, the, the opportunity to kind of walk into a great situation. Absolutely, for Monique. And I'm telling you, when you talk about longevity and you talk about survival, it my, in my business, the training of acting and the experience, there are times that I just would have fallen on my face had I not had that background. I started out on stage and learned so much on how to develop a character, how to stay in character. And because there are a lot of people that don't know their business. And as an actor, I mean, when a director tells me something, sometimes they don't know anything, particularly in television. And you're working with egos. You're working with, sometimes I worked with a woman hater. Uh, You've, you've got to know your stuff, but you've got to know you too. Be, you can tell a person in a very nice way how to go to hell, but you don't have to say it. Uh, I've only had one, one or two experiences in all my years of directors who tried to bring me down because of them being uh, women haters. And we can talk about that another time, but it all comes back for what we're talking about today, knowing who you are, knowing your craft, even on stage. I just did a show not too long ago where the actor, there were three acts and he went off. We were in the first act and he jumped because there were so many uh this was theater. This was theater, correct? This is theater now, yeah. There were there's so many cues that were so similar in each act. So you had to like really listen and stay in the moment as to knowing where you were. And he said something, I said something, and he went off to the second act, and we're in the first act. So now you can't say, wait a minute, cut. Right. You got an audience there. Yes. So what because of but because of my training and knowing how to be a character, develop a character, I was you're able then to bring that actor back, saying dialogue that wasn't in the script, but you say it as that character. And where it comes from, I cannot tell you. All I know is that you have to be prepared, you have to be professional. Uh, I, I remember doing a play where <laughs> the actor was supposed to come on stage. I'm talking to the little young actress and she had done the show. Oh, she'd done the play maybe 30 times. This was only about my third time. And I'm talking to her, but she whispered to me, such and such isn't here. And I looked up and I realized she's telling me that the actor that's supposed to come on isn't there. So now in character, I got to make up dialogue. Right. I could never have done that had I not really understood my character. And I'm so I go off and I'm telling it was member the the play was member of the wedding. Now I'm like talking to her da 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 da. da but I <laughs> oh the adrenaline is going and I'm oh I'm I'm like this, but in character, it's da 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 da, da and, and we had to go upstairs to the actual house where we were, were in the garden. So I, I'm talking to her, and I said, you come on up these stairs, da 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 And then I realized, oh, my God, if I go up the stairs, then when he, the actor does come on, the blocking's going to be a mess. So I said, oh, it's too hot up here, but I'm going to tell you, and I go back down the stairs. <laughs> And the line is, honey, I'm so glad to see you. That's when he comes on. So when he did come on, I said, honey, I'm so glad to see you. Because you, you were so <laughs> glad to see him. But you were not making up lines, right? <laughs> making up lines the whole time as that character. But, but not you knowing what I was going to say or how long it was going to be that I was going to have to keep talking. But you were so fabulous and you are- The audience never knew. 
They never yeah, I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they didn't. And you have obviously you've been in Hollywood for over 50 years now. Can you even believe that? Five decades? I know. I've been in my home 51 years. God amazing how beautiful how what a blessing that is it what is a blessing. blessing it is a blessing and i don't complain um not only because of what's happening in other parts of the world ukraine and those people but just knowing that um i appreciate my blessing i appreciate god giving me the confidence to go after a dream that i really didn't know if it was going to be possible or not but the fact that I had the courage to come to Los Angeles, leave the Bay Area, and didn't know a soul here. Nobody was on television of my color. Nobody was doing commercials of my color. But just believing from Sidney Poitier doing, um, he won the Oscar for uh, Lilies of the Field. And I'm believing, okay, I think I was in college then. I said, boy. It's going to open up. And then after I started teaching, uh, Diane Carroll got the uh, uh, got her show called uh, Julia. Some of you out there, you're too young to remember. Yes, but, I remember but, Julia. But for her to have her own show, and I, I was teaching then, and I said, I either got to go to New York to try to do stage or I've got to go to Los Angeles. And I decided yeah. Los Angeles because it'd be easier to be broke and down and out in now, warm what, weather what than was cold. It about, what was it about acting specifically that pulled you for you to know that that's what you wanted to do and focus, focus on? Um, I think it started from childhood. I was an only child and, um, you know, at that it, back in the fifties, we didn't have a vaccine for polio, uh, and my mother was afraid that I would catch polio. And uh, so, when I got in from school, my I had to like go straight to bed and rest, get a rest for an hour, and then I had to practice my piano lessons. Okay. Um, so I spent a lot of time alone. I didn't have brothers or sisters. And so I would keep myself company by doing what I, what I learned later found out was monologues. Mm -hmm. I would play with my dolls and they would, I would talk to them and da, 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 and da, da, da. Wow. So um, when I got to uh, as far as high school was, uh, I went to an all white school in San Diego uh, it was a ritzy school area. Only be, I went there only because the naval housing ghetto that I lived in was had that jurisdiction. I had to go to that school. Not that I lived in that neighborhood. We I sure. was in there, you know. And so I got a terrific education. And but the plays that they did, they did all white plays. I could only do one line. Uh, one-liner made roles so uh, but the way I excelled was to participate in the high school competitions and so I would come back with these trophies first place in oral oratorial interpretation dramatic interpretation and um and so I be, knew that that was my calling. Yeah. But my mother was saying, oh, no, 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 no. And I think I've said it before because she said to me, you know, no, we got enough. Because I wanted to take voice lessons and dance lessons, you know, and she said, we got enough of colored folks singing and dancing. You can do something you can that's legitimate. <laughs> and, and she considered acting to be legitimate? No. No. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, no. And at that time, now remember, Monique. At that time, what was offered for women of color? So you were either a social worker, a teacher, or a nurse. And I couldn't stand the side of blood, so I knew that was out. And I really loved working with children, so that was a you know automatic thing. So for Hillary Clinton uh, to have been an attorney 
at that time. She she went to law school, but that was nothing that a that someone of my stature would would even think of sure. doing. Mm -mm. So is, what? what uh, so when I oh I I did see the movie, my twenty five cent Saturday matinee was seeing Harry Belafonte and Dorothy Dandridge in uh, Island in the Sun, and they also did Carmen Jones. And that was my first time seeing a woman that was skinny with co of color. And I said, oh, I can relate to that. Maybe a skinny Black woman can be in movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that's really important because what we know is that when people see, see, it's it's not when people hear about people. It's when people actually see what someone else can become, mm -hmm. and they believe in the possibility of them being able to do it for themselves. And you know how you and, and you God is so good because Harry Belafonte, seeing him with Dorothy Dandridge, and do you, can you imagine I got to work with him? Yeah. Now, see, this is the inequity of of Hollywood. You know how much older he was of me, but I was able to be his his wife. Uh, what was it? White man's burden. I think that's what it was. But I was able to tell him, hey, you know, you really inspired me and thank you so much. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so wonderful. You were able to do that. You had the time to do that. Mm hmm. Share with us some of the challenges that um, women actresses of color still face now in Hollywood. Hmm. Okay, I'm. I'm no longer that young ingenue or the leading lady. After, regardless of color, after 40, you're going to start having some challenges. And if you can still keep working after 50 and 60, it's like. As you have, as you as But, you, but you know, the parts aren't there, you know, like they used to be. So um, the challenge for me is that there just aren't many roles for women over 50 and 60. I mean, shoot, I'm, I'm looking at, and God bless me, I'm, I'm going to be 80 in a couple of years. So, <clears throat> and I say yeah. that honestly, because television exposes it anyway. Yeah. There are no secrets. So yeah, ladies, I'm going to be 80 and I embrace my age, but film doesn't, Hollywood doesn't. They know that if once you get over 40 or 50, forget it, your history. And one of the things that's a problem is that we have, the, our writers are mostly men and the men write about their experiences. We need to have more women writers and older ones who will write about the older woman experience. So I'm at a crossroads right now, and I was thinking about getting more involved with producing. There is a film that I'm doing. Um, uh, we shot it. It's got to. It's got to be coming out pretty soon. It's called Juneteenth, and I got got to do some comedy for a change. Wonderful. Not getting stuck Wonderful. in the drama, and it's starring myself and Antoine oh, Antoinette Robertson. Uh, she was the, one of the stars of. Dear white people, some of Wonderful. you know her. Just a lovely woman. She took care of me on the set. I, I was truly her mom. She she made sure that things were right for me. Thank you so much, Antoinette. We we have some questions coming in. Oh, we do. Okay. So so let's go through some of them. Um. So let's start with this. How? What historical character would you play if you had the opportunity? Historical character. Yeah. Mm. I've never thought about that. Histor historical. Because I love the outdoors and I love uh, being physical, I'd like to have been someone who helped get the slaves across the country walking and and the danger of it. Uh, 
what, what so many people don't know about you uh, and I've learned, which, and I think it's so wonderful, is that you are really an activist. Mm. And I think, you know, so many people don't know that about you. What has moved you in that direction over the course of your life? Um, back in the, it was, it was the 60s. I was, I lived in, in San Diego. That's where I grew up. And my mom said, you should know more of your family in Oklahoma. So, you know, I want to see, I want you to go to Oklahoma for the summer and be closer to your grandparents and all of that. So I, I get on the Greyhound bus. I don't know if we have Greyhound buses anymore. I think so. I don't know. And I get as far as New Mexico and I meet these white kids. They were like probably 18 or 19, but for me, being like 13, they, they seemed really older. And I met the, uh, you know, you have, they have these stops where you can get donuts and coffee, you know, in a little cafe or wherever on the, at a bus stop. And they were talking about what they were going to be doing. And I could hear them and I overheard and I said, wow, can I go with you? And they said, sure. Well, was that the dumbest thing to do? I mean, <laughs> Well, anyway, they they go to Mississippi to work with voting rights and so many, um, there was so much going on then. And me, I grew up in California, the racism I hadn't really experienced at that time, show you how dumb I was. Uh, this was when we're all loaded in with uh, the Volkswagen, remember the Volkswagen station wagon? Yes, I don't yes. know if people remember that, but that's where we were basically sleeping. But and that was because we would pass motels and they'd say vacancy, and I said, Oh, there's one, and they would keep passing it up because they knew what I didn't know, and that was that they weren't going to let me go in there and they didn't want me to sleep by myself in the van. That's how dumb I was. So, anyway, I'm, I'm a part of. SNCC and the freedom people, we're going to change it being a Mississippi. I get down there and we go to court. A lot of the kids were uh, jailed. And in the courtroom, there's only, uh, there's no American flag at all in the courtroom. It's just a Southern flag. And I happened to be seated in, in the courtroom, it was just a little place, in back of the, the sheriff of Itabita, Mississippi. And every time they'd say something in court that was really racist or ridiculous, even at 13, I knew that, I would just, I'd be back and say, oh, that's ridiculous. Why are they talking like that? No, isn't that horrible? And this, the redneck sheriff is looking back at who that is talking, this little stupid little girl. Honey, we get back on the bus and I go and the, the neighbor, neighbors let different kids stay at their places. We didn't have hotels or anything. I wasn't back at my place 10 minutes when uh, some of the SNCC kids were talking about, Margaret, Margaret, you got to get out of town. The sheriff is looking for you. The sheriff is looking for you. Well, that you didn't want to go to jail because if you did get out of jail and not disappear, you were lucky. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of white kids, mostly Jewish, who were released from jail and you never saw them again. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to get out of town, they, they snuck me out of town. And one of the experiences I had, I still have the, um, the scar on my arm from a German shepherd biting me. This was when we were trying to get uh, our rights to to just vote or, or your right to, to eat in a restaurant. And I'll never forget that to this day. So since then, that experience made me aware of, of how bad things were. 
I was in, I didn't really realize how racist San Diego was until I was in high school. Uh, we had the San Diego Union and the San Diego Tribune. Blacks were not allowed to be in that paper unless it was a crime committed. So, and that was primarily why I left San Diego and went to the Bay Area because when you find, I, I think I was angry at myself that I was so ignorant, never seeing the racism before, thinking that you're equal and then finding out that you're not. Um, but now I'm hoping that I'll be able to get involved with uh, the fair fight that uh, Stacey Abrams is, 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 has been involved with. And also uh, she, I'm hoping that she's still going to run for governor in Atlanta. We have so much at stake now. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm not as interested in acting right now because acting's always going to be there. But our voting right people, they're taking it away from us. They are taking it. They're finding a legal, horrible way of doing it. And if we can't vote, we can't ever change anything. And I'm just hoping that the young people won't be discouraged and not vote at all. Taking away uh, all the uh, the places where they drop the mail, the vote. Sure, the, the mailboxes. The mailboxes, uh, making the rule that it's against the law to give anybody any water or food in line and making it so that you have to spend uh my daughter, who lives in Atlanta, she was going outside of her area to to vote. And in the white areas, it was like, what, she said she waited 10, 15 minutes? Whereas in the black areas, it was hours. So now they're changing that rule that you can't even, you can't even go out of your own neighborhood to vote. Yes. They're, it's horrible. And I, I just hope that more young people are aware of what's happening. I look at Instagram and I'm not putting Instagram down, although I haven't been on it for a while. I wish that we could be as excited about what's happening with the vote and what's what's really going to direct our lives and affect our lives for the next generation as excited as we are about what somebody's wearing. Absolutely. I yes. mean, and Absolutely. I don't mean to put it down because I was into it too, wearing, you know, try and, but I found that if I tried to do some, say something educational, people were only interested in what I was looking like, what I was wearing. I remember wearing a pair of shoes that I had worn before and, and I, I had had the same shoes on uh, for this other event and someone commented oh good now i can see what kind of shoes she has yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's it's important for us to unite or we're going to wind up with a with a, a another putin in in charge of everything absolutely yes absolutely and, and we have to stay vigilant with it we absolutely have to stay yes yeah, and that's I, why it's I feel so badly when people say, oh, I never vote. Nothing's ever going to change. But we can't change things without the vote. Yeah, absolutely. And we can't change things without each other. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. So I, so I so much appreciate you in this show because we we need to be able to communicate. Yes. Even, you know, with or without our friends, but just be able to leave it, put it out there, how we're thinking and feeling and growing and how do we help change things. And allow our stories to inspire others so that they can move through whatever dramas or traumas that may mm -hmm. have been them down so that they can reach their highest level. And this is, that's one of things that, that this show does through the stories that we tell of women. Thank so, you, uh, well, oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to share a few more questions that we have from our audience. 
Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. You were just talking about Instagram and all of that. Well, they want to know how do you keep yourself looking so great and and you know, <laughs> yeah, you're, especially during all of what we've experienced. Well, I think that um, the cameras today are very very forgiving because I have crow's feet and. And, you know, they say black don't crack, but I say it sure does droop. Because when I do this, I look a lot younger. But I And I'm thinking, damn, can I push this up some kind of way? And um, I, I, one of these days, I always say, I'm going to look in the mirror. And everything, all of those horrible teen years that my daughter took me through is going to show on my face finally. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Look, but, uh, she's lovely now. She, she's beautiful. Yeah. But, honey, that identity crisis that she had, that, uh, that wore me out. Yes, yes, I understand. So I understand. all you women who have daughters like that or sons, hang in there with them. Hang in there with them because it'll, they'll, it'll, they'll grow out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And now you, you adore your daughter. And I know you get to spend a lot of time with her uh, in Atlanta. Oh, but let me say this. Yes. It's not expensive products that, that I use on my face. I just put, I, I think the main thing is because with acting, we use so much makeup. Take that makeup off regard every night never never go to sleep with your makeup on because that's when your pores open so just keep your skin clean and moisturized and i've used uh i i've even put crisco all over my body after after uh, a bath and they they <laughs> they've got the, the the odorless kind now but but so that you don't go to bed smelling like fried chicken Oh my goodness, but Crisco! That could, uh, hey, Crisco? That, that could be a that could be a good thing though. <laughs> Crisco, Crisco. Oh Crisco. But now they have the odorless, you know. But you, the trick is is to more keep yourself moisturized, and while your pores are open, oil yourself down. Okay. Well, I, I've never heard that one, Margaret. I think I'm gonna skip that tip. <laughs> I got that from a little old white woman. She was giving me a manicure in Texas and her hands were so soft. I said, Oh my God, how do you do that? And she, she, she shared that trick with me. Wow. Chris well, thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, with the audience. If anyone tries it out, you know, let me know. How that goes. <laughs> get the, get the, if you have a, a wonderful mate, get the kind that smells like fried chicken. You'll have a great time. <laughs> Oh my goodness! That you, you are you are a hoot. You are a hoot. You gotta stay young now. You gotta stay young. Keep everything Absolutely. alive. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the more recent roles that you've had that so many people have loved you, um, in was being Mary Jane, being the oh. mother of Mary Jane. Can you yeah. just share a little bit about that experience with us? That was so wonderful. Uh, I'll tell you who what made that show great, and that was uh, Akil and uh, the writer and producers. And it, it changed after the second season when they were no longer involved. Yes. We still have the same storylines, but um, the love in it, and 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 hopefully the audience didn't feel that. But when we started out, it was it, to me it was a much better show than than how we how we ended. But it was a beautiful experience, and I never would have been cast had it not been for blacks being in charge. Because mm. uh, I mentioned it earlier to someone, and that's that white uh, producers and, and, and directors they seem to think that. Women of color of a certain age have to look a certain way. They can't be still be attractive. And um, and I'm not saying that that's not good. I'm just saying that they're stuck in a certain look of how they perceive women. One wonderful thing about the um, Cosby show was that when it aired, it showed 
the different colors and hues in a black family. Yes. And white people don't see the whole rainbow. They want to put us in their image of how we should look. And that's that's that was one of the uh, that's been a, a problem for me, being a woman. I'm not saying I'm all that, but I'm not what they want me to be. And I've said, you know, hey, I can't be gaining weight because I've got diabetes in my family. I have to have to take care of myself, and I have to be me. I'm not letting Hollywood, and don't you ladies out there, don't let other people define who you are because you've got to be you. Whatever you do, it's got to come from you. And that's what makes it authentic and real. Absolutely. And and Miss Margaret, you are real. You are real. Well, I try to be. As a matter of fact, sometimes I'm just too real. <laughs> well, you know, we appreciate it because your words, your knowledge, your experience can really be a gift for someone else in what they're doing or what they're preparing in their life or mm -hmm. their career. And it's really important that they have information uh, with authenticity and honesty that, that really matters, that can move the meter for them. And so mm -hmm. your honesty uh, with us today and of course in our interview for the show has just been a great blessing for us. So thank you oh, so much. Thank you so hey, much. My blessing, my blessing. I, I appreciate the time and to be able to share. And and it, it makes me have introspective about myself. I mean, we're always growing and we're always, we always have to be willing to learn. And, and like I said earlier to someone, you know, I'm, I'm in a transition I feel right now. And I've got to do what I was suggesting for others to do, reach out, ask questions. Uh, how do you do this? Or how do you do that? I like that. How, how did that happen for you? And not be afraid to ask. Yes. And that's, um, that, that's something that, that's a challenge for me because of my childhood, you know, not, yes. not, not able to ask for myself. So, and so we're always we're always learning ladies. Uh, we're so what will you do? Cause this is, this is a perfect question uh, since you share that and thank you for sharing that. So what will you do to get yourself to actually do it? Because it is tough for you. It, it doesn't feel uh, so comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. So what will you do to allow yourself to get the information that you need at this okay. time? Okay. Well, first of all, you got to figure, I got to figure out what is it I, really want to do okay what's because i'm in the twilight years of my of my life yes i don't have the years ahead of me that i have behind me so what's important to me that's that's the decision i have to make i know that the political thing is very important to me so i want to go after that but as far as the business goes um i think the producing thing would be good for me uh, I I am cited as one of the executive producers for Juneteenth that's coming up, that light comedy that I did. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And that's my first and only executive producer credit. But as I was saying to your producer, I would like to get a, get behind, you know, the scene yes. and put some things together. There, Like you said, we have stories and we have history that's not being written about. And there's there's plenty more. There's It's opening up now. And what I don't want to see is that all the opportunities that are happening now to start shutting down. Sure. That's happened before. Sure. So if we can keep those doors open with with curiosity and and the the intelligence and and the drive to do it. That's the only way it's going to happen because if we don't do it for ourselves, nobody else is going to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we don't tell our own stories and, you know, even with all the stories that are told, there's still so many others that are not, that are, absolutely. Still, missing, that are still missing. And that's where we have to bring many of the voices to life that uh, we don't currently hear from. We have one more question before we wrap up. 
Um, and let me make sure that I get it correct. How do you maintain yourself financially in such a tumultuous business? <laughs> Yeah. That's a good question. You know, like I said, I grew up in poverty. And so um, Christmas was a nice Christmas dinner and a treat. We didn't we, we didn't have money to do gifts. So even today, gifts at Christmas isn't important to me. It's getting friends together and family around food. That's Christmas for me. So Growing up in poverty, having to always pinch pen, uh, pennies, and you know, I only had one bra at one time. I'd have to wash that bra out every night, and I put it in front of the stove to dry. Mm. I went into teaching. Okay, teachers get paid once a month and very little, and a lot of that money goes into the classroom to to uh, keep your kids. Uh, interested. Even today, teachers are doing that. So getting paid once a month and having to budget, budget, budget. Okay. And then from teaching, what did I do? I went into acting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so after each job, I'm wondering, okay, uh, how long can I live off what I just made? So I really, even to this day, I have a poor woman's attitude i mean about money it's because it's almost as though okay margaret uh if you if you waste your money and do this you you might you might be sorry and and what happened covid hit okay getting ahead of myself i started investing uh in a retirement thing uh get yourself a good person i didn't start until i was what, early 40s? And that's what keeps me going now. Uh, coupled with the Screen Actors Guild pension. See, for years, I always was able to qualify for the Screen Actors Guild health insurance. I just barely would make it by. But that did nothing for my pension. When you barely get by. or And I know that even today, people are saying, well, I can't put anything away because I can barely make it. If you put so much money, a little bit of money away in the right place, not in the bank today, because they're only paying no, no interest. But in the, if you put it in the right place, that little bit of money becomes a lot. Yeah. If you do it with the right person, you got to, you know, you don't put it in these risky, risky things. You can make a lot of money with the risky place, places, but you can lose it all, too. So because I got with a good advisor, financial advisor, and I have him today, with the, with the Social Security and my teaching of retirement money, and with Screen Actors Guild, and with the investment money, that keeps me living okay. I can still fly business class, first class, without worrying about, you know, God, you know. So, and this is what we don't teach our kids. This, when when kids reach 13 with the Jewish uh, kids, with a bar mitzvah or something, they're giving they're giving their kids stock or they're giving them an investment in this or some money to invest. What do we give our kids? Nikes and all this stuff that does nothing for our future. We don't teach about credit cards and interest and what you have to do to keep good credit rating and um. I could go on and on, but that's, no. that's what keeps me. That's what I've turned down about. And I said, there's not that many roles, but I am picking and choosing. I've turned down about four roles in the last, what, five weeks, because I didn't feel that they were worthy of projects. I want to do, I want to do projects that that makes sense for me 
that I want I want them to uplift people. Yes. Um, and the other thing is, is that I'm finding that there are too many people in the decision making positions that don't know what the hell they're doing and they're doing crap. And I just don't want to be a part of it. Good for you. So, uh, but Good that never, you. I could, I could be my age and still be worrying about, uh, well, when am I going to work again? And, and well, well, what am I going to do it with COVID? It was okay for me not to work. I mean, my passion, I wanted to work, but I didn't have to worry about losing my home or, or any of those things. So that that's a blessing. And when I work politically behind the scenes, I, it's okay. I can volunteer. And that's it's all a blessing because here I am, a black woman that started when there were no blacks doing anything in the business that I desired to be in. And I made the right decisions. I Even today, I work. My car is 12 years old. I couldn't believe it. It looks good. <laughs> But it's 12 years old. I never invested in the high-end cars. But you got to look good. So if you do a red carpet, just rent a Mercedes or whatever for the night. Nobody knows it's not your car. And I'm not stuck with those payments and in insurance and maintenance. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's all about the choices, right? Each choice. Absolutely. And, and, and see, you know, poor people, we're the ones that spend money in unwise ways because we want to look like we've got it. The rich people, they don't have to look like they've... I mean, who is that that owns everything? He he looks like he buys his shirts at <laughs> what? Food for the what? what is it? What are those stores? Kmart or somewhere. And he's worth billions. Yeah. What does that say? Yeah. But oh boy, we got to we got to have this label and that label. Why are you buying those labels if you don't have any stock in them? <laughs> you're right, Margaret. Yeah, you're right. It's you not know? yours. It's not yours. So we 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 as a people, we have a lot of, to to teach our children. But but yeah, I like to I like to look good. But shoot, and the people, the people that have money, they don't, they're not spending it. They have stuff given to them. When you see these, the red carpet, A-list actresses, they're not paying those thousands of dollars for those dresses. They've got people who are donating them to, for their advertisement. Yes. So the more money you have, the more money you can make and keep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I know I've gone over, Lord. No, you you are wonderful, and you have been a blessing to us, not only in your interview for the show, but in your interview here with us mm. live. And so, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, you uh, thank me so many times, so I'm gonna I'm accept sorry. it and get off this time. <laughs> well, thank you, my darling. I've had a great are. time. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe we'll bring you back for relationship talk. So, oh, OK. And we're so happy to be able to be your first online interview. So we appreciate. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Blessings to you. What do you have coming up? Anything coming up that we need to. Well, watch? it's a it's a uh, Juneteenth movie. It's mm -hmm. about Juneteenth, a family who's giving this big Juneteenth celebration in the community. Yep. And I'm so happy because I got a chance to do a little comedy. You can see a little a different side to me, y'all. Yes. Yes. And you may be doing some online teaching coming up, too. So. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, so we you know something I don't know. Yeah, I know a little something, something. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your night, and okay. uh, and we look forward to bringing on some more women on the move from our national television shows. So, okay, well, yeah. bye, people, and I hope I was able to give some some of us or you uh, some insight. Absolutely, you have. You've blessed many people today. Thank you. Thank Take you. Well, that's, and that's a, my blessing. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.